Hey, everybody. <laughs> we are live. <laughs> Sorry, we are late. We were having some technical difficulties, but here we are. We are here for another Get in the Room interview. And this time I have one of my favorite, favorite, favorite clients in the world. She's a real one. It's Mickey Hill. She's in Style Confidence Collective. And, you know, last week or the week before, whenever it was, what is time, when I was doing a lot of these interviews, it was with some of my people in my network, you know, some CEO friends, some entrepreneur friends. And this week, I wanted to bring on some of my clients that are just super kick ass and they need, a, <laughs> they need a platform too. So Mickey is our first guest and I could just tell that she was a freaking real one from the moment that she joined Style Confidence Collective. And I think the moment that really sealed it for me is when, I mean, we've been like DM friends for a while now <laughs> within SCC, <laughs> but when my friend was in a coma, Mm -hmm. You reached out to me and you were like, I'm doing this energy healing thing. I'm going to send some healing to your friend, like if that's cool. And like you used your precious energy healing time for me. And it just meant so much to me. Aww. And it like really helped. <laughs> Luke's amazing. Luke's and I, go, amazing. I go, this girl's a real one. So why don't you introduce yourself? and just let us know who you are. Great, Lauren, thank you. This is such an exciting opportunity. I really appreciate it. It's so fun to talk to you like in person as in person as we can get right now with the Rona going on. Right. But I am I'm Mickey Hill. I am a happy member of uh, Style Confidence Collective. And honestly, I got to tell you girl, this morning if it had not been for SCC and really getting my act together, you would be looking at a disheveled mess. I mean, I hit the ground running at like literally 6.30 this morning, I you know, after my meditation, my phone blew up. So I, I hit the ground running. But I'm the founder of a company called Advanced Insights. We are a, I call myself a small market research uh, brand strategy boutique. And I say small, it used to be a larger company before I relocated to the San Francisco Bay Area. But I'm primarily a qualitative, meaning non-statistical, Researcher, I'm a nerdy girl. You know, I love to geek out on data. I'm always sending you links for different things. I love it. I love it. You can it. always count on me to help you with anything. But I study human behavior uh, in the role of very much like a cultural anthropologist. So companies hire me to understand their 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 consumers or their customers' behavior or that of their perspective or, you know, competitive, uh, competitive set customers. So in fact, I'm doing a competitive set study right now, which is a little challenging, but we're able to do the work digitally. But that's kind of it in a in a nutshell. And I love I love what I do. I've had my company for just over 25 years, which I can like, wow. scarcely fathom. I was like 10 when I started the business. But you know, yeah. <laughs> a child, child prodigy like Zuck. Yeah. So there's been a lot of twists and turns, you know, economies go up and down, but I've somehow, I've been able to stay badass and I've been able to keep myself in a lot of rooms, which is really an amazing thing. I sometimes look at my resume, I'm like, oh, who is that? Oh my God, I'd hire her. She's so smart. So. Nice, nice. <laughs> and what got you interested in human behavior? I think just my, this is going to sound funny, but my family, my family of origin, they're really fascinating people. And I remember sitting back and just watching the social dynamics unfold, you know, just within the context of my family, you know, cousins, and I just have one sibling. So small, immediate family, but just watching, watching that behavior. And then because we moved a couple of times when I was younger, uh, you know, school age, like little kid, uh, my dad worked for an early tech company. So every time he got a promotion, there was like a, you know, a transfer. So I think because I was moving into new environments on a couple of occasions, leaving, you know, one city for another, I had to observe my surroundings and figure out 
what was going what was going on. So I was, you know, super social. My mom used to laugh that I moderated my focus group when I was like five or six in the pediatrician's waiting room, organizing the children. Oh, <laughs> you do. You're gonna play with this, you know, I'm Billy. No, this is not for you. This is for Sarah. She was like horrified, but the kids were okay with it. You know, that I was like the little ringleader as a child. So awesome. That Isn't it was interesting how, I don't know, that's been the case for me is from a very young age, like I knew, what I wanted to do. Like the world was conspiring to set me up for what I do. And that's obviously the same for you. Uh, do you feel that contributed to you getting into so many rooms? And I know just from like our personal chats that you've dealt with tons of adversity along the way. Do you think it was that inner, inner drive like from the jump or things that happened along the way that made you keep pushing to get in? I think it's both, but I think it's what you said first. I think it's that inner drive. And I was thinking about, you know, what we might discuss in our conversation, like, you know, who am I? And on a really deep level, and anybody in my family will tell you this, if you tell me no, if there's something I really want, something I deeply desire, whether it's a thing or an experience, if somebody tells me no, it's like, I got your no over here. I mean, that just... <laughs> Feels it. I've been that way since I was a child. My parents were like, I think I was just totally exhausting. I'm sure they felt I was like two children. But if there was something I was clear about, no was not even an answer. And so I would get no a lot, you know, through my teen years in college, you know, early into my career. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll make a note in my book and I'm just gonna keep on, I'm gonna keep on moving. But also not letting, I have faced quite a bit of adversity and I had to create my own room, my own business to have any type of career that was meaningful or satisfying, but not letting these other, I don't know, outside influences tear me down. So it's really having to build resilience and strength. But I think what gets me in the room, it keeps me in the room is my, you know, one of my natures just, just one of my clients described me as a force of nature. I'm like, I hope that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I know I knocked out some other vendors um, on some research. It was my first, you know, exposure doing work for this product team with a large peripherals manufacturer. The other teams raved about me. This one, they probably do the lion's share of work. And he's like, you're really good. I said, thank you. I love what I do. So I think I think when you're authentic, it shows. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's, you know, I've talked about it a ton because I'm, you know, an entrepreneur, I started my own business, you have your own business, but there's a misconception that like, I just magically made my own room. I didn't have to go through all that bullshit, but there's like a series of rooms before that, whether it was, you know, starting in corporate or even if you didn't, which I believe you did, um, there's still other rooms to get past, whether it's alone or whether it's presenting something to a client. So how have you navigated the different rooms? And maybe just take us on that journey from sure. where, you are, where you are. I think, you know, probably the easiest place to start is like, you know, without going back, back to college and getting frustrated with, you know, wanting to, to get into a room within corporate America. The irony is I got turned down for getting into the brand side of the business at Procter & Gamble. <clears throat> Three years later, I was working for them as an employee <laughs> with a, a research startup firm and I got the experience I wanted. So even though I had my sights set on one room, <clears throat> it wasn't working. So I ducked into a more secondary room which was market research. This wasn't, this was not my career, Lauren. I was not supposed to be totally doing this. Right. Use my background to, and my interest in psychology and anthropology and sociology, even though my degree is in marketing, to fling myself into more of a brand. You know, I wanted to get on brand at, at P&G. And that was like, you know, that was really hard to get into. And being a woman, let alone a woman of color, this is, in the uh, what is this, mid to late 80s, it was like, yeah, no, we're going to put you in sales. So I created a different room by taking another opportunity. And I figured this is temporary. I'm going to learn from this room. And I did. And it bounced me back to, to corporate America. And I went in in a better place 
than if I had started uh, because now I came in under the umbrella. So I'm in this room. The halo was set by my uh, boss, who's still one of my closest and dearest friends and mentors. Um, she cast a very, you know, people adored her. They worshiped her. And so I came in as her golden child in this room. So people listened to me in a way that if I'd gone into Procter & Gamble cold, it would have never, even if I'd got into where I want to go. So I, I used that opportunity to really consciously, deliberately, intentionally build my identity to keep expanding, you know, her business and my identity and use that as a stepping stone to go on to whatever that next series of rooms were. So I reached max capacity with her in terms of opportunity and pay. I knew it was time to go on to a different room. So I went on to a series of other supplier side market research firms, all the while creating the room, building my identity, but I left because the room became restrictive. Yeah. Why? Because there's so many people that do not look like me in my industry. And I saw white counterparts flourishing in some of these companies. And I was literally, even though I had the title and the rank, I was not allowed into certain decision-making rooms. Yeah. So I conferred with friends, like, you know, maybe I need to go jump back into corporate. And they were like, don't do it because, <laughs> you know, you know, whether they were like my Asian friends, black friends, and even some of my, my white girlfriends saying it's like, it's so hard to rise relative to their white male counterparts. They, they were looking at me with envy. I'm looking at them in envy. We're all like, you know, dazed and confused or something. Yeah. So that's when I realized I'm going to have to create, I'm going to, have to create a new room for myself. And this is my room that I create from jump. So I didn't totally start from scratch. Although sometimes you do have to start from whatever ashes are on the ground and start from scratch. But the company I left, uh, the last big research firm that I left uh, my boss and I had a great conversation. He let me walk with my entire portfolio of clients. We had an agreement where the clients that we shared, but he and I, that was the last room where he wouldn't, he wouldn't let me in. And he never really gave me a super satisfactory answer as to why that was. But years later, he just said, you know, you were my best and brightest. I didn't want to see you go. He said, but you're also the most difficult. And I was like, I've gotten that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like pretty, but like he difficult was, you know, I asked questions, yeah. you know, there are things affecting my team, my cost center, my bonus, don't mess with my money. Um, and I, I just want to sit in those meetings. And if I have a question, I, I, that's what I thought a meeting was for is that we're all having a discussion. And that really wasn't what the meeting was for. It was just, you know, everybody else was playing. Yes, man. And I'm like, <laughs> I was always that kid in class. Even in college, I had professors, everybody was scared, you know, shitless of, and I'm like, there goes my head. They're like, oh, right. God, she's asking a question. And it wasn't like a bad question. I just, I have a need for information. There's decisions impacting my future and that of the team, the group of people that report to me. Everybody else is has the same role within this big company. Why am I the bad guy? Yeah. I, mean, I made him uncomfortable. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, so there's, there's rooms within the rooms. <laughs> there's the game that everybody's playing that you don't want to play and you don't know. And it's like, there's all these different micro decisions that we have to make until we decide, you know what, it's time to build, to build your own. Yes. And I feel like, you know, having a mentor that can help you navigate those things, even if you don't understand, is so valuable. Like I was talking to a mentor of mine yesterday and, you know, I'm that person. I'm the, you know, I want to ask the questions. I operate under a set of principles and I know I need this information. I need to do this and I need to do that. And it's like, no, there's a game over here that needs to be played. And I'm like, I don't want to play because, you know, but it's those decisions that you have to make. And it's that perfect timing that's involved too of yeah. like, okay, 
I'm going to play. I'm going to learn. I'm going to build a little fort with inside of this room until I've got that muscle set where I have no other choice, but to like fly free and, and yeah. do my thing. So I think that's um, some great info that you shared about that because it's not a matter of this isn't working for me. I'm out of here. I'm going to build my own. Like there's certain things that you pick up along the way that are really helpful in the journey. Yeah, I agree. It's about strategy and smarts, but you said something I think that we shouldn't let go of, you know, I'm a spiritual girl, clearly, but there's a lot to be said for serendipity and focus. Because when I started Advanced Insights, you know, the first time I pushed the opportunity away, I was like, no, 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 no. The client came back with this massive assignment that I really wanted, but it had to be the only way they could award it to me without a competitive bidding process was I had to be minority vendor status. I mean, that was the final straw that pushed me into you know, creating this, this room. And I was scared, Lauren, I was so scared, even though I knew this was what I wanted to do. My, you know, like, oh my God, why am I scared for the first time in my life? Why am I being such a chicken shit? <laughs> like, 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 oh, legit, my dream's coming true. So once I stopped resisting, right, I went with it. I, I, I mean, to this day, I sit back. And when I think about it, literally, it was like the planets and the stars just started aligning and it wasn't there was effort but i wasn't like sisyphus like oh pushing up over so there's a balance you know there is action but it should not feel like force that you're forcing something to happen to me when i start feeling i'm in that like deep resistance like force mode i stop because it's like no 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 no, no, no. this is like this is this is a warning sign. So I don't I do not force at that level. And of course I you know I pushed my luck a little bit and got burned. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Not too bad. Yeah, but I think it's an important factor that there is this sort of spiritual component in all of this too. Of course, of course, it's so valuable. I don't know if you were on my master class the other day, but I, I it. oh watch the replay, you'll love it. But I feel like you really embody those success secrets that people don't really know about, you know, they're like, oh, if I work hard, you know, if I push, if I shout loud enough, I'll be successful. But it's like, there's strategy in how you dress. There's a spiritual component. So you understand like your own serenity, your own peace, like your own mission, you know, there's tapping into your, to your personal power. Like there's all of these different things that we can do creating a story for yourself by knowing what the big vision is. The big vision is I'm going to create my own room, but I'm going to do these things along the way. So I feel like you really embody all of those components and that's what makes people successful instead of beating your head against the wall. So let's talk about the style component because obviously you're a very accomplished woman and you you're very successful but you still found your way into my world and hang out in this community where you continue to work on yourself and your style. What triggered that move? So I think I've said this in, you know, various pieces and places is that I think I was a pretty stylish person until motherhood. You know, I'd have some ups and downs. I actually wanted to go into fashion merchandising. I wanted to be a retail buyer, when I was in high school and college and I realized that, you know, the buyers, you know, I had friends who had parents that were buyers and it was like, you know, you may, you might want to rethink that because it's a lot of crazy hours. And I thought, uh, I don't know, but I chose something else with equally insane hours. But so I, I really had a sense of style. I think it was easier for me when I was younger. It just seemed more natural. And as I got older and certainly I think there are a couple things that happened. I moved from Cincinnati, Ohio to San Francisco, to the Bay Area. So that's like a whole different way of dressing in many regards. You know, Ohio was somewhat conservative, but it's more reflective of what you see on the East Coast. And out here, you know, it's like freaking anything goes, right? One of my best friends was just like, you can wear anything and dress in layers. I'm like, what kind of fucking advice is that? But you're right, it's insane. So there was that. 
And then having a baby, and now I'm surrounded with a new tribe to bring in tribes, right? Now, you know, I'm with a new tribe. I'm not with my old tribe back in Ohio. I don't even have my employee tribe that I had. I became uh, more of a, I was like one of the early virtual businesses uh, where I had people working remotely because I, my team didn't even want to reload. I offered reload to keep people. They're like, no, we're too scared to leave Ohio. I'm like, okay, fine. Wow. So it was a lot of new, you know, to get cultural, get anthropological for me, a lot of new adaptation and trying to find a tribe, right? So just like in Primates of Park Avenue, dressing to get into the tribe is really what where it's at. I mean, you can show up in the, 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 on the plains or the savannas where the tribes are, you can show up in their villages, but unless you've got the right markers on, you know, they, they, they don't totally let you in. And it's all, it's our biology. It's just human nature. It's wired into us. We cannot help this fact about ourselves. So I think that's where I started becoming a little schizophrenic in terms of my style. And then the baby comes out. I've got like, I'm like a whole three other sides. <laughs> It's like trying to dress with this body, navigate all these new things. I mean, it was just, it was a yo-yo. So I, I found you sometime, and I think it was in 2018. I was thinking about like, when did I, you know, find you? I had just kind of started pulling myself together. Like I lost, you know, I've been on the yo-yo thing. So I starting to realize I need to get myself together. And it was working with uh, two major Asian clients uh, from Korea and Japan. And I had to go to Korea for a trip and I hired a cultural consultant. And that's when I realized my shit was whack. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I was like hot mess, sweet Mickey Hill, you know? I was just like, oh my God. She was like, right, because I'm going into a culture now where they look at style and not even like it has to be a brand, but you better have on some badass fabric. It better be the right cut. You better have some real jewelry. Don't even front with some costumes. So I realized that in order to do business with these clients that were coming to me, I needed to dial it up. And I was a little lost. I had some really great pieces that I'd had over the years and that I'd acquired, but then I didn't know how to put it together with other things. Like, I think style is a muscle that unless you practice it, you lose it. I firmly believe that it's like anything else that we do in this world, whether it's meditation, money management, work, it is a muscle. And girl, my muscle was weak. I had all kinds of just disparate data, disparate pieces that I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I started watching your videos and I'm like, she's on point because you're cute too and you're a sister. So I'm like, and she, I, like, I kind of like her style for me too. So I'm just going to copy her. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my, my hack. But I'm like, shoot, I wanted to join. And then I found out about personal style PSU and I couldn't do it because I had like a time and money crunch going on for a minute. And by the time I was ready to do PSU, you had launched uh, SCC. And I'm like, well, shoot, let me just jump in here for a minute. And then I'll like get over to PSU. Um, and I had done, done that one style uh, challenge where I think I was one of the... Oh, yeah. Style Awakening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Style Awakening was a finalist. And I had taken that one soon. I'd done another challenge, but I kind of did it, you know, a little, I'll be honest, a little half-assed. Because again, I was crazed at work. And it actually made me look at why I was so crazed at work. I'm like, I need to build out a better team, which I'm actually still working on but it really still was a catalyst for me because it made me took me back to my anthropological roots of we send messages about who we are as an individual and the collective uh based on our physical appearance and that is hardwired into us as animals as mammals it's yeah. i've had this argument for with one of my friends i think i've mentioned to you that's very resistant to adapting her style you know she's a scientist i'm like i'm gonna get sciencey on you and throw it back in your face i want her to join scc and she's all hard-headed i'm like well i guess you'll get hungry enough and desperate enough for a job that you'll eventually join <laughs> right 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 and i love you know i love that perspective because like y'all this is a pro like she actually does this for 
a living. <laughs> like she's not just like, oh yes, it's no, she does this shit. I don't do that for a living, but I research it because I'm fascinated by it. And I talk about it all the time. It's like, we're constantly sending messages. There are these tribes. How we present ourselves is that visual marker to let you in. And people are like, ah, Lauren, just talking about her style shit. It's true. And Hard I love it. Hard data. It's, it's, it's just fact. And like in SCC, we read this book, Primates of Park Avenue. Um, and we discussed it in our book club. It was one of our fa my favorite book club discussions that we had because people got so resistant of like, oh my God, it's so material that you have to have a Birkin and you have to do this. It's like, yeah, in the Upper East Side, that's the code. And wh wherever you are, there's a code, you know, there's the, the Michael Kors bag or the coach bag or the Louis Vuitton or the whatever. It's just hardwired. It's just fact. It's just true. And I love how you speak about the muscle because yes, like I find that a lot of people resist like coming into the full LM world, you know, they'll like dabble with a YouTube video or they'll like, you know, tap an Instagram, but the idea of paying someone to help you or joining a community or taking a course, they're like, I should know how to dress but it's a muscle. If you're not trained in like what the people are wearing in the room you want to get into, what the fabrics are, how to put it together, you don't use it, you lose it. And it's then you, and then you fall behind in everything else. It's not a matter of looking cute. I could give a shit if anybody looked cute or not cute or stylish or spent money, but it's the beginning step of you falling behind in everything. It is. And I think it was Karl Lagerfeld that had that fabulous quote about sweatpants being a sign of defeat. Mm -hmm. When I was at my like kind of lowest, I was looking at my clothes. I'm like, where did I go? What happened? You know, I went through this terrible, I guess it was like five years ago. I went through this, it's a long story, but I went through this really sort of dark night of the soul time and I just started spiraling. There was depression and anxiety and I I started getting myself out of it, of course, with professional help, but really saying I need to, this isn't me, like who, and I don't know what has happened and it doesn't matter. Let's just start moving forward. And I'm like, I need to go back to myself. And simultaneously, it's ironic when you start to really deeply work on yourself and level up or whatever you want to call it, it shines as just a stunning white hot spotlight on people around you that are not doing anything, right? And it's all, it's like, how does working on myself throw you into some other weird place where now you're attacking me on a personal level? So I literally, I think I got rid of like at least a half a dozen friends that really were not healthy relationship, good friendships. So I cleared the deck. And just by doing those two things, focusing on myself, working on my visual presentation, it it, it, it got people all upset with me. Like, who, it was that sort of that, who do you think you are mindset? I'm like, I don't know who I think I am right now, but y'all gotta go. And I can right. go out, out. Right. <laughs> y'all some shitty ass friends. So, <laughs> it's, so it's so true. And I launched, um, when you watch the masterclass replay, you'll see, but I launched this beta program um, that I'm calling Beyond Style, where I'm taking a very small group of women through like private coaching and group coaching to teach them how to do these things that, you know, that I've done for years, that you've done for years, just naturally, because you're a researcher, you're a grown up, you've had these life experiences, you're a spiritual person, but all of those components that help you truly, I call it the ultimate after. So it's mm -hmm. not a matter of just like, oh, your outfit was whack and like now you're cute. It's that, oh my gosh, like you got to go, this pattern of thinking's got to go and we get to design a new life for ourselves. So I launched that on Monday. It sold out in less than 24 hours. So anyone I know, who's watching, I'm excited for you. I want to get in. Like you can join the wait list. I'll pop a link um, so you can get on the wait list. But obviously, 
I think a good first step for people that miss that is getting into SCC because we do, we work on our style and we work on our growth. So we can start making some headway to get into those rooms and just feel okay with being ourselves. And there's a different standard for women. There's a different standard for women of color, especially in the way you present yourself because people are just looking for a reason to say no to you. It's true. And I'm still up against it. Right. Against it. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of how you've navigated that in your life or any experiences that have come up? Yeah, I think, you know, when you know, you start to figure out it's not always, you know, an overt thing. Like right. racism, everybody thinks racism is this big thing. And yes, that happens. I've had people curl the N word at me and a bunch of other things. But racism, a lot of the times that I've experienced at the corporate level is a lot more discreet and quiet. Um, so I've had, you know, things where I had a, a client recently where, well, recently, it was a few years ago, I should qualify that, a few years ago, where it was interesting, suddenly the focus groups that my team and I had recruited, and there was another moderator, it was a massive multicultural study, suddenly there were all these issues with people not really thinking the respondents were sort of up to metal, and the same with the Chinese moderator. Suddenly our groups are on the radar, like there's something sketch, suspicion, even though we are always very transparent and what we do, how we do. And that's when I was like, you know, I've been to this rodeo before. This is about something else. And I, the client was inappropriate with me, a, a female. She was uh, very inappropriate with me, white female. And I, I just held, I held my ground, but I also dressed intentionally that day because I knew in advance that there were some issues that it's like, there's something that does not sit well with me. So I knew when I got on site, I have to dress for two constituents. So I have to dress like, like I would never wear this Chanel jacket in the focus group. Like who would, like, no, I'm talking to rich people. They're like, what are you doing with this fancy jacket, right? Right. But I might wear the jacket, take it off and have on like my t-shirt or you know, I've got the queen of the rolled up sleeves, that's my jam, in jeans. And so I can look like I'm kicking it regular homegirl in my research, but then I need to go deal with these, you know, challenging clients at times, the jacket comes on, I'll pop a collar. So <laughs> I don't look, I'll pull a Jane Fonda and pop a collar on a white shirt, or I'll go to the bathroom, I'll unroll my sleeves and suddenly they're down. And I got on some badass French cuffs with, you know, fancy ass cufflinks. So I got like some sense of messages. And that's, I was, I, somebody on my team was like, you look so different. I was like, yeah, I popped my collar. And I've got on cufflinks. She said, I didn't see the cufflinks. I said, sleeves were rolled up. She's like, you look scary. I'm like, that's the point. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, again, I know I don't look like, there's not that many people of color who do what I do. There's like maybe two dozen of us. And of course we all pretty much know each other. Right. But you know, I've used style and that's when I realized I got to get a grip because I realized I was actually having some issues at work where I don't think I was showing up looking on point, um, sort of tied all back. But I, you know, definitely I think that I've, I've worked overtime my entire life to present a certain way uh, that represents who I am. But also I hate to use the word makes them feel comfortable, but makes them feel like, okay, she's not so dramatically different that we can't find her relatable yeah. in, some, in some way. But it definitely has been a slippery, a slippery slope over time where there are times it's like, that's not really me, but I know that's the right thing to wear for that, that situation. Um, yeah. It's hard. It's really hard when you don't look like everybody else in the room. And I've got a big personality, which, I'm just tired of dimming my light. I'm like, y'all are gonna have to deal with it or not. I mean, we're respectful, but there's no more putting a basket on the light. You know, I don't really swear too much in meetings. Heavy emphasis on too much because it does. <laughs> <laughs> but my clients expect it now. They know they're gonna keep it. I keep it real with them. So, and I've let clients go. So not every client. Is a good client. I don't know if you've experienced that in your business, but not every client or not every customer is oh, yeah. a fit. Oh, yeah. 
I know recently something that's been coming up a lot in like my meditations and my journaling is I want people to not like me. <laughs> like, I know that might sound weird, but I've spent so much of my life, you know, growing up in a predominantly white area and being afraid to be too loud or to this or to that. And constantly having to dim your light. Oh, you can't outshine the man and you can't do this. And like that constant dimming. So people will be comfortable and like, okay. And I've noticed even in my business and especially since, you know, I'm just calling everything since 2020 happened because <laughs> what is like, what is this of just noticing like, how did some of these people slip through the cracks, you know? And it's because of that dimming and of that, like, you know what? I need to make everybody feel welcome because I do, you know, as a human, right. I don't want to make people intentionally feel uncomfortable. I do want people to feel welcome and invited to the conversation. But I realized that I had done that almost to a fault where I remember you came to my defense in the comments where I posted um, something about Black Lives Matter and people were in the comments with their all lives and they're this and they're that. And you were like, <laughs> you went in. Girl, <laughs> you I'm like, in. I got you. Mm, I'm like that cat meme. <laughs> right. And like, you know, I've been talking to like various mentors and, you know, I feel like a lot of times, especially as a person of color, it's like, well, you almost don't want people to know that you're like, black, black, you know? So you kind of got to chill. And I'm like, you know what? I invite people to not like me. I remember the last time that I had my hair in braids and I shot some of my course videos with the braids. Some I didn't because I shoot at different times. And, you know, I change my hair every five freaking seconds. And I got <laughs> feedback from a client that I didn't look professional when I had the braids in. You know, and so it's things like that where it's like, I'd almost rather just be unapologetically, you know, when I first started shooting my YouTube videos, I'd be very careful about how I spoke and what I wore until I was like, fuck it. And like, I swear, I wear whatever the hell I want. And I get comments, Lauren, you're not professional. You're wearing ripped jeans. You're not professional. Your hair's in braids. You're not professional. Your hair's curly or like, enough. I invite you to not like me. I invite you to know exactly who I am. So you can make a choice, take it or leave it. But again, you all, you have to like build up to that point too, yes. in a, in a strange way. But it's I, so true. It's yeah. So I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, cool. I'd rather have less clients, you know, like I'd rather have less that are ride or die I launched something in less than a day. Everyone was like, I'm in, take my money. Let's freaking do this. I'm like, I'd rather have you 15 for life and the couple hundred that are in SCC for life than 10,000 who are like, Nyeh. That's That's well said. That's I, like everything you just said resonates. It is exactly my trajectory. My entire, you know, like my whole life I've been placating and making people feel comfortable because I did not look like them and answering a host of crazy questions. And I think as I got, you know, further along in my career and started having more success, um, my last boss, Clint, the one who wouldn't let me into the room, but yet was like my biggest champion and supporter by like basically giving me like all of my office equipment that I needed. I probably got $10,000 of office equipment for like a thousand. I think he felt bad, but he cheered me on and was like, definitely always a conduit for business. He, he, one of the things he taught me was like, you know, price yourself for what you know you're worth. Cause we charged a fortune for our services. He said, I don't want to charge X number of dollars and have to deal with 10,000, you know, MFers. But like, I'd rather charge three times than what everybody else is and have like a third of that. He said, because you're making the same money without being raggedy and stressed out. And the same applies to what you were just saying. It's like better to have a tight consolidated group 
where you can be authentic and charge, you know, your price to, to meet your worth versus trying to satisfy all these other people because it'll fall apart. I can tell you from a marketing perspective based on what I do, that is literally the recipe for disaster is trying to appeal to, to, to so many constituents because it's, 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 it's not realistic. You got to like deal with your low hanging fruit and forget the rest. Just forget the rest for now. They'll, they'll either get in league or not. Right. I know. I remember a couple of years ago, um, I never, you know, and I still, there's certain things that I just keep to myself and other things that I just, you know, run my mouth on. And at the time I didn't really speak very much about politics. I still don't speak overly about politics, but I stand where I stand uh, <laughs> as a black woman in America. And one of my potential customers was asking me, um, you know, before I spend money with you, um, what are your stance on this? Who did you vote for? I see that you like Tony Robbins and he, you know, he's sexist. So if you like this and I'm like, oh my God, like I, buy or not. So because I was in that, you know, I want everyone to come into the pool. I was, you know, entertaining her bullshit and she got into the program and she was a nightmare. And I was like, you don't belong here. Here's your money back. Yeah. The doors over <laughs> is over there, you know, yeah. and that is a testament to being like, I won't say inauthentic. I'll say being fearful of being authentic. Yeah. yeah. I was so afraid if I really say what I want to say that you'll shut me out. But instead I let her in under false pretenses and she ruined the whole community everyone's like oh my god like <laughs> who is she <laughs> like then, hey, and then, money, get out i i need the peace you yeah. know customer service emails and you know my team will be like what you know what do we do with this person i'm like tell them to leave tell yeah. them to fuck out go <laughs> bye that's what I, but that's what i do for a living i get the group dynamic and it's like you get the warning sign and in a focus group it, it's like it doesn't happen all the time, but back in the back in the old days when we did everything in person, like five months ago, right? I was, it's like, wait, when was the last time I did anything physical? It's so strange. Everything is everything is digital right now, but there are times where you have to extricate the bad seed. Like you have to get them out of the room, and sometimes you get clues, and you don't know what to do with it. Like she was starting out difficult. And there's times where if I'm moderating a group, so it's a conference room. And it's so funny, like I've got this glass cabinet behind me. That's almost like the one way observation mirror that the clients sit on the other side of. My back is to them, you know, the respondents are facing. And they're always, I always tell them, I said, look, y'all need to be, I'm in it. And I don't always see it unfolding the way that you do, but you need to let me know via text message or a knock on the door if you see trouble brewing because <laughs> get them out before it gets started. Yeah. And it always starts with some weird, off, you know, subject thing, and then they're on my radar, and I try to get them out before the group goes too far. For that reason, it does destroy or at least erode the group dynamic, and it impedes it impedes the learning. You don't get anything out of it. Everybody's having a bad experience, so right. that is reflected in my work all the time. I did some online stuff, and it's easier online. I can like, oh, you got to go. This guy started swearing and getting crazy. I was like, click, right. <laughs> He just disappeared from the screen. I gotta start doing that more on Zooms. Just yeah. Like, oh, 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 I don't know what happened. That problem. My clients were like crying. They, they sent these emojis with crying emojis because they know me. They're like, yep, I said problem child. Boom, you know. So right. Yeah, and it's not even about like, I welcome different views and I welcome conversation. You know, it's not about agreeing, but it is about that that like-mindedness, that collective energy field. And that's why I always feel so good when we do, you know, some of our group Zoom discussions in SCC. Cause I'm like, we're like, this is the coolest bunch of women ever. Like this shit is badass. And I feel like it got more badass because I became more unapologetic just outwardly. And then all of a sudden all the right people come in and I feel like that, you know, 
is a pattern that we can adopt for everything, you know, for our style, when we're authentic, when we're in business and we're authentic and which room we're in and when to leave and when not to leave. Cause then you get to create that world around you. That is your world that you want to exist in, you know, that's really well said. I'm going to take it to the next level. Yeah, you, know, you said resonates, but look at what Beyonce did, right? Like she was, I would watch her and I'm like, that little girl, you know, I love her music, but it's it's okay. I wasn't madly in love with it, but I liked her like a lot. And like when when that song Formation came out, it was like, oh, <laughs> what? I know. Crazy. I was devouring everything. She, something happened. Something clicked into place with her. She stopped being who she thought everybody wanted her to be, right? She found out who she was, and she's like, fuck it, I'm moving forward. I mean, I lost my mind with formation. I mean, I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown. I was like, what? And then Lemonade, you couldn't even talk to me for like a month. Right, Stop right. it. Stop it. Same year. I was never a Beyonce fan. You know, someone would come on the radio, I'd be like, mm, all right, you know, shake, yeah. shake a hip to this. But then, yeah, once all that happened, but I think, you know, I've, when I was getting ready for the get in the room challenge, which the challenge is technically over, but if people still join the groups open until August 3rd, so you can still participate and meet the women that are in the challenge. But when I was preparing for that, I did a bunch of research on people like Beyonce, people like Rihanna, you know, people like Oprah. And I still feel like it's something clicked in her, but I don't think she would have had the success that she had if she just came out with that. You yes. know, so I feel like, you know, she got into the entertainment industry room and she had to play to the trends of the girl groups and the matching outfits in the you know, the hit songs and she just inched her way in. And then, you know, then she's with Jay-Z and it's a little more into this particular room with this crowd until it was time to freaking erupt and explode yeah. and create a movement. And now what she does is so valuable beyond her music. It's like allowing other little black girls to be like, I can be a star. You know, it's allowing these issues that she believes in to come to the forefront where I truly don't believe if the day Beyonce came out, she dropped formation, people would be like, what? Yeah. Who? Yeah. So it is that, that careful timing and that careful calculation and strategy to be like, when is it time? You know? And it's knowing yourself and being on your own path. And Lee, you think about walking on a path, it's one, it's one step at a time. You don't like start running uphill. Like if you do, it's like, okay, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, you're gonna, you know, crash right. and burn. And it's like, my daughter and I like to surf. And like, you know, I've taught her, so before we get in that water, we gotta gauge the wave sets. There's a lot of counting that we do. And it's real, I'm looking at current. So we spend like a good 20, 30 minutes when we're together, I'm like, you gotta be safe, you know? So we, you've gotta know, when to get in and how to get out there safely and how to ride the wave in or how to, you know, stay on your, stay on the right path. But it's rarely about, you got to get into the water, but you don't have to do it all crazy yeah. really and authentically, but there is a strategy, but it has to be connected to you, who you are authentically and get help. You said something really important. I can't wait to see the replay about mentorship. I would not be where I am today without mentors, you know, my first boss, Carol, she's like in her like, she, like late seventies now, I can't believe it. My old boss, Clint was my mentor, but he passed away a few years ago, which was really upsetting. Um, and I've got some other mentors outside of my industry that helped me with different things, but I really would not be where I am today if I had tried to do everything completely on my own, I would have crashed and burned. So I'm not into this, this school of thought of do it all yourself and grind 24 seven, you know, some of that nonsense that I love, you know, one thing about it, I love about Lovey Ajayi Jones, she talks about get a team and you've got a good team. You've inspired me there to really recalibrate, you know, what I've got. I've got, I'm working on some new ideas that are more, you know, geared towards smaller 
enterprises and, you know, entrepreneurs, small companies that I'm trying to get, you know, figured out so I can maybe potentially bring it to market next year, but I need the right team of people around me. So you've inspired me about what it means to have a team. And I know there are a couple of ladies in SCC that are hatching some ideas. I said, I will take you on pro bono. I want you to get into, I want you to start out on the right path because to, to go down in flames is very expensive. That's why companies hire me is to help them understand what they need to do so they can create advertising campaigns and messaging to connect with the right audience so they don't go down in flames. So, you know. Yeah, you got to have mentors. And I feel like one of the biggest mistakes that I see, which is why I launched this little beta program with just the 15 women to start is everyone hears about having a mentor and then they hop into somebody's DMs or somebody's inbox like, will you be my mentor? And it doesn't work that way. Like it doesn't work that way. And I feel like in the beginning of my career to find mentors and to really understand what a mentor mentee relationship is, I had to pay for it. You know, I paid for it by hiring coaches and it helps you enter into a different circle. Yeah. You know, like my first true mentor, I handed her ass 5,000 bucks and it's like, we're sitting down together and we built a genuine relationship where now, you know, I can call her whenever I want. I don't have to pay five grand for it, but right. she entered me into these bigger circles where I met different people and I got into organizations. So I have a host of mentors, but you have to, again, that's another room that you have to get into. Yes. And sometimes it's all about being in the right place. You know, if you're in a corporate environment or you have a boss that kind of takes you under your wing or paying your way into the room, finding someone that you respect and being like, girl, teach me all the shit that you know. Right. Because that can take you places. I tried for years to do everything on my own and I lost so much money and I lost so much time and it would have been way better off just to be like, cool, coach me, help me. Yeah. Let's now, that's well said. And I spent money several years ago taking a professional development uh, uh, class. It cost, you know, about $7,000 a year. I'm like, oh my God, I have no money. But it was, it was money well spent because it got me out ahead of the curve and competition. It was geared for, it was based in the Bay area. And I was living in Cincinnati at the time I found out word of mouth through some friends. It was geared for the tech community to help them sort of manage the speed at which innovations happen, but they created a, you know, more of a discourse around what it means to be a business person and a sales professional, which is what every entrepreneur is selling. But like you, I did not want to spend the money, but I knew there would be the coaching, the learning. I mean, it was, it was intense. It was like one of the hardest things I did. I, I was, I was looking at either doing this or going back to school and working on my, my master's in something I didn't know what. So I decided to do this. I think I got a better education than, you know, if I'd gone and gotten my MBA, which would not have been a bad thing, but it really got me out ahead of where I need to be, especially now as it relates to tech. It created this incredible baseline for that. But, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you're so lucky. I get pissed at that. Like luck is the intersection of opportunity right. and hard work. There have been some things that are like the stars literally just landed in my hands, but most of it is the, the grit, the tenacity, the determination, and also just showing up and being in the right place at the right time because I met the right people because I looked the right way to get into the room. Right, right. Oh my and God. Looks. The luck thing drives me crazy. I mean, I've had like family members who are like, oh, you're so lucky. It's like, uh, seriously, <laughs> do you know how hard I work? Do you know how much I think? Do you know how much I have to put all this stuff together to make it work? Like, oh, I ain't luck, baby. You could no. have the same luck if you took the same steps. <laughs> exactly. You're not just sitting in your, you know, your bedroom making little random videos. You've got like a whole production and a behind the scenes crew. And I think it's important for people to realize you need to evolve where, you know, you, you have to grow in that way that you cannot do everything 
by yourself. I had the same criticisms with family. I'm like the really the only entrepreneur. I think now I've got some younger cousins that are because they saw me like, you know, have the family attack me. They're like, you know, we don't understand. Well, why don't you just get a regular job? And my mom, when I told her I was working in market research, she's like, are you a drug dealer? I said, how do you go from market right. research to drugs? Like, what are you even talking yeah. about? <laughs> what am I doing? I would be living a lot better if I were. You know, what are you talking about? I'm driving a Camry at the time. I'm like, Drug dealers don't drive Camrys, mom. You know, I, you don't. <laughs> and I, till this day, I will never know what that was about. But okay, all right, we're gonna just work with that. So right. yeah, all right. Man, so good. So good. Thanks so much for chatting with us. And oh, my pleasure. I could keep going on and on. It's been such a treat. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been fun to uh, show up and show out with you in the group. So thank you. I'm so yeah. excited for this challenge. I, I'm i almost done. I just haven't, I, I think I was able to type up day one that I'd written by hand. So I'm hoping to post all of my my days in the room um, over the weekend. So thank you for keeping it open a little bit longer. Work has just been really intense for me. Yeah, and thank you for being just such a valuable member in Style Confidence Collective. I know that all the ladies really look up to you Aww. and just provide such great conversation when we do our chats. And I love seeing your posts. And I'm so glad that we were able to meet and you know have a little, little virtual friendship happening too. That's I the- love it. That's the one thing, you know, in this, I feel like I've learned so much during this pandemic and this alone time and quarantine and everything else and just have gotten so much clarity. And I love the fact that my clients are people that I would kick it with, like, no doubt. I mean, some of the people that join Beyond Style, I see them in the comments, like, we have a wait list already. Like, we have people in the inbox that we had to say no to. And the people that are in it, I'm like, oh, fuck, yeah, I, I love her. Like, I feel like I know you guys because, yeah. you know, you're the people that I love. I'm, like, proud that you guys are my clients. Like, I'm proud that you're a client. I, like, thank you. I'm like, oh, I got to send this to Mickey. Like, that's incredible. Like, who gets to do that with their customers, you know? Like, not I love it. Our DMs give me life. There are days where I am like sitting at my desk and the tears are like running down my face. I am like, oh snap. You sent me some last week where I was like, I was like, oh, my daughter's like, why are you crying? I'm like, they're good tears. I said, it's, it's too funny. I can't even, I can't even. And I know my girl Niesman is so excited that she got into your program because she's been working on some things and she was so oh. excited to share that win. That's I- my girl. I can't wait. I told her and I told Katie, who are both also in SEC and now they're in Beyond. I had like a legit vision for the two of them when I was in a breathwork session. And I'm like, they're going to soar like so far. And like Laura, who I see in the comments, she wanted to join. And I was like, do whatever it takes, get her ass in because that should go in places too. And I, I, I love that I like get to know all of you and we get to do really powerful shit. So thank you for being one of those powerful women. Thank you. And I will see you inside of, of SCC and just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so amazing. My pleasure, my dear. Thank you for the opportunity and I'll, I'll see you around. Perfect. Mm-hmm.